Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Genesis study. I'm glad you decided to tune in with us. We're in Genesis chapter 13 today. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a disclaimer. It was my plan last week to do 12 and 13, and the Holy Spirit did not move that way. And then it was my plan today to go into 13 and 14. But as I was studying and kind of rounding out my study of chapter 14, I realized I didn't know what I didn't know. And I realized that there was a lot of words that were hidden that the Holy Spirit wanted to keep ministering to me about. And so I'm going to keep digging in chapter 14, but today we're going to dive into 13. And hopefully, as we move through this, there will be some chapters that we can pair together. Um, I will tell you this. We are in this section, and I'm, I'm thinking of it as the Abraham and Lot saga. Okay, it is the story of Abraham and Lot. It is the beginnings of Abraham, right? Uh, but he's got this nephew named Lot who was along from the, the ride. And at this time, we have Abram. He's not Abraham yet. We have Abram who is, feels indebted to this nephew because his father, Abraham's fa Abram's father is dead. That is Lot's grandfather. And Abram's brother is dead. That is Lot's daddy. And so in many senses, they are the only family that they have. And although God has given a commandment, he said, come out from your family. And God has started to kill off his family. He still feels this indebtedness to his nephew. And I would imagine, God forbid, if something were to happen to my sister and she had a child, I would hope that in a natural sense that I would feel indebted to that child, to care for that child. And, and, and so it, there is this wrestling that is going on with Abram and his, um, and his family and his morals and his faith. And I kind of want to sit there for a second because I think that's the Holy Spirit because sometimes our morals are not, in, are not steeped in faith and so what seems morally right is not what God said. And I think we can, t we can push that envelope into our politics. Sometimes morally, what we think is morally right is not what God said because often God will tell us to do things that are in contrast to what we think is good, okay? Now, often our faith and our morals are in line. Do not kill. It is morally wrong to kill. It is biblically wrong to kill. My faith says I should not kill. Normally, our morals and our faith go hand in hand. But every now and then, God asks us to do something that goes out of who, what we think we have been coded to do, something that we have been socialized not to do. And so in a social, in a fatherly sense, Abram is going, his name is a father. He will be Abraham, father of many. And so this idea that I am the father, that I don't have any children, and Lot is the closest thing that I have to a son. And because Lot is the closest thing that I have to a son, he feels responsible. And so today we're in chapter 13 and something goes awry and that relationship does not end, it is just readjusted. Okay, I want to establish that, that before Ab Abram and Lot go separate ways, that relationship with Lot is not ended, it is, uh, it is amended. Okay, would you follow me? It, he's, he, the relationship doesn't come to an end, it just takes a turn, it changes. And it changes because God said it had to change. Okay, he doesn't any less father Lot, he doesn't any less throw Lot away, he is still his nephew. We still see Lot show up a couple of times after this, but after today's chapter, the relationship has to change. And I wanna submit and suggest to you that God is, is suggesting to some of us that uh, we've got to have a change of relationship with certain people. It doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean I can't come to your rescue every now and again. It doesn't mean that we can't go to the family reunion, but you can't be an active participant in my life every day if I'm going to keep walking in the will of God because you're going in one direction and I'm going in a different direction. And so I can't move, I can't move in the same direction you're going in. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It doesn't mean that I don't care for you. It doesn't mean that I don't want the best for you. It just means that since we can't split, we're, we're not going in the same direction direction we can't walk hand in hand together can I go a little bit further it's one of those reasons that when I talk to my young people and when I in myself am dating and getting married um, is when I talk to my young people that I always push that God created for Adam a compliment 
a suitable helper and that having someone who you have charisma with, someone who you like, all of that is marvelous, but if they are not suited to where you're going, God didn't send them. Okay, Can, I, I hope you're understanding that people who are in your regular day basis, you need to be suited for. Can I go a little bit further? When you join a church, because if you're, if, you're, if you're studying the word, I know you can be spiritual, but in your Christian walk, you need to belong to a body of believers because we are, we are subject to one another, and as a body, we can function as one. A body doesn't work right when it's missing fingers. Body doesn't work right when it's missing a heart. Body doesn't work right when it's missing a foot. Can it survive? Sure, but it's not at its best when it's missing these pieces, all right? And so when you join a church, that may be a great church. The pastor may preach with vigor and passion. You might like the choir. It may be convenient to your home. But if you don't have, there's not a suitable spot for you. If you can't exercise the gifts that God gave you, it may not be the place you need to be. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that everybody needs to go and be the preacher because that's not everybody's gift. But if you are in church, you need to find a place that you can exercise your gifts, just like some churches are really good at doing local missions. If your gift is local missions, you need to be in that church. <laughs> if some churches are good at doing international missions. If that's your gift, that's where you need to be. All right, I'm going to keep going and get off of that. So here we go. Verse 1, then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Mark that word, at the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai, to the place which the, walt, the altar which he had made there at first. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. So Abram has gone down to Egypt, as you remember last time. Abram has gone down to Egypt, and as he has been down in Egypt, he realized it wasn't good for him to be there. God made it abundantly clear that that was not where he was supposed to be. That was not the place he had called him to go. And because that was not the place that he had called Abram to be, it was incumbent upon Abram to get out. Even after the king told him to go, he had to venture and when he finally made it back to the place that God began to speak, y'all remember I last week I talked to you about proximity and that God was not moving in Abram's life until he got in proximity of the place he was supposed to be. And when he got in the proximity of the blessing, God began to speak. Remember, I shared with you my own testimony and how every time my feet touched, I could hear the voice of God declaring blessings and promises over it. I, it didn't happen if I was off of the property. It didn't happen if I wasn't there. But when I got there in proximity, then God began to speak. I want us to see this. I want this to be very, very clear. I want us to understand here and, and, and park it right here that Abram is, is not, he doesn't lose his call or his position as the father of many nations, that God's promise does not go away. God does not abandon what he said because Abraham got out of proximity. But I do want you to see this, that God was not speaking when Abram was out of proximity. When Abram was out of proximity, God was not speaking, God was not pushing, God was waiting on him to get back in line. He had to return to the place that God spoke last to hear God speak again. Okay, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that your blessing in particular is tied to a place. What I'm saying is that God will, if, if, when you step out of the will of God, you can't hear the voice of God because God's voice is tied to your obedience. Does that make sense? God's voice is tied to your obedience. And so God is not going to give you instructions when you're going in the wrong direction. Okay? Unless it's like you better get out of there. Get out of there. So Abram returns to the place that he started at first. And I want us to explore this because this is an issue that a lot of times we have in the church. When people fall and they stumble, especially when they fall and they stumble publicly. Because some churches, and, in, and, and this is not just in the modern age, but in general, some churches find themselves at the very beginning, they, some churches find themselves 
in, in, in position where they, um, when somebody falls, they pretend as if it never happened, okay? So they can stay in sin, they can stay steeped in sin, they pretend as if it never happened. And we would say that that's smothered, covered, dunked in grace, but I also think it's negligent. I think it's negligent. And then we have some churches who, when somebody falls, we never let them come back, never let them act operating their gift, never ever can they touch an organ, a piano, can they sing a song, preach a sermon, walk, work on the usher board. They are not welcome to be among us because they messed up, screwed up one time. I think that's negligent as well. And then there's another school of churches that, that, that welcome them back, and then they start them over at the beginning as beginners, and I think that's a little bit better. But if I can just sit down on the church's role, maybe even the black church's role, dare I suggest to you that we need more accountability and more community, less gossip, and when somebody falls, instead of treating them as if it never happened or never or always reminding them that it, that it happened rather put things in place to help them stay on the straight and narrow I, I think we need some accountability partners I think we need some community I think we need some 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 family some brothers and sisters to shore one another up because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God I I, I don't think that you calling me and telling me uh, WXYZ about about this person is going to help them get out of sin and I don't think that turning my back on them and pretending like they don't exist is going to help them get out of sin either. Uh, I think that we've got to get in a place where we understand that we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all come up short. We all do. But the truth is that I need you, you need me, and the reason we go to church is not to judge one another, but so that like-minded saints can walk together and try to figure this thing called out, called life as a Christian. And so what I want you to see is we get this example here that God does not forsake Abraham. He does not tell Abram, Abram, you are cursed. Abram, I'm going to make you forfeit the blessing. Abram, he doesn't pretend like it didn't happen. Because if he did, Abram would still be down in Egypt. It's when Abram returns to the place that God speaks, when he returns to the place that God speaks, then he goes back to the altar. Abram calls on the name of the Lord and then we begin to see progress happen according to what God has spoken and suggested to him. I'm going to say this to you, Nineveh, as, as, as your new youth, as, not your, your new youth pastor, I've been a youth pastor for a while. As your youth pastor, there are young adults who need somebody to shore them up. And I guarantee that if the church was a place where in their mess they could be cleaned off and somebody showed them how to do it, and part of my fear is that a lot of us don't know how to do it. We don't know how to live right. We just know how to keep it quiet. We know how to keep it quiet. Or we don't understand the sin that they're in, and so we judge that. But I guarantee there are a lot of young adults, a lot of young professionals looking for a place. How do I know? I got to talk to them on a regular basis. I talk, I talk to a lot of young people who are looking for somewhere to belong. I, as much as, and I love Pastor Will, and, and y'all can tell him I said this, maybe he'll watch. Um, as much as I hated the slogan, a place to belong, it was prophetic. It was prophetic. A place to belong is what we should be. We should be a place to belong. We should be somewhere that we could come back. And although I struggled this week, although they, the, the porn kept coming up, although they, they slipped this week, although something went wrong, they tried something they shouldn't have tried, although it kept happening this week, that they could find somebody who used to suffer with that because I guarantee you somebody here who just ain't talking about it. Somebody who suffered with that and say, you know what? Come on, let me show you how God cleansed me, cleansed me and washed me by the water of the word. I'm telling you. So, but I want you to see this. Abram comes back. He goes back to the altar and he calls on the name of the Lord at the altar. But I want you to notice Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds, and tents. And now the land was not able to support them, that they might not dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. I want to make this point. I want you to see this, that, that, that Abram comes back to the land. 
and they have grown so much. God didn't stop blessing while they were in Egypt. God didn't stop blessing while they were in, Har in Haran. God didn't stop being God. When God had put his hand on Abram, he put his hand on everything that Abram had. And because he put his hand on everything that Abram had, Lot was around him and Lot flourished. Lot's, Lot's stuff flourished. His possessions flourished. And as his wealth flourished, Abram's wealth flourished, God blessed them. And Lot was blessed by association. And so much so that it began to cause strife. Now, I want you to notice this. The scripture does not mention strife. The scripture does not make no mention of strife until Abram comes back and gets in the will of God. I want you to see this, that even the Bible suggests to us that when we get it right, tri test trials, hell and brimstone are going to come. They're going to test you with your weaknesses. They're going to test you with chaos. And if he can't test you with that, he's going to bring strife among those you love when you decide you're going to do right. I was talking to a guy, a guy came to my office. He was talking about how him and his girlfriend, were they were having sex. And they were having sex. He was like, yeah, I'm going to marry her eventually. They were having sex. And then he, he comes in. He decides he's going to get serious about God, his walk with God. And he decides we're not going to have sex till we get married. And so they went from a couple of years of, of, of actively fornicating. And then they decide they weren't. And then it caused massive strife in their relationship. There wasn't no strife going on in their relationship when they were in sin. There was no strife in their relationship when they were in sin, none. But the moment that he decides that he wants to lead her well, decides he wants to be in the will of God, now strife comes. Now, nothing has changed. He's still treating her the same. He, they're still loving each other, but they've decided they don't want to be in sin. And, and, and they don't want to be in sin. And when they make a decision that they don't want to be in sin, strife comes. Why does that happen? Because Satan is trying to demonstrate in your life that nothing good comes of you doing what God wants. He's trying to do that before you begin to get the blessings of God. Because if he can do it before you get the blessings of God, you'll never make it to the blessings of God. You'll, ne you'll, never, you'll never make it to what he's called you to be, where he's called you to be. You'll never possess the things that he's, he's, he's called you to. And because of that, because of that, a lot of people never experience the fullness of his power, never experience the fullness of his grace, never see God bless them. They don't know what providence looks like or feels like because we get in, we get right with God, then the depression hits. We get right with God, then all of a sudden we're studying what we're struggling with anxiety. We get in the will of God. We finally make the step. We get a blessing. Now hell breaks loose. My kids aren't acting right. We get right with God. Decide I'm not going to sin. Now it's strife on every hand. That is not God. That is Satan trying to convince you that nothing ever comes good of you walking with God. And so Abram goes back to the altar and now there's strife. And I love what he does here. I love what he does here. He remembers that God told him in, while he was in the Chaldeans, come up out of your, from your family. And that when he made it to Haran, God said, come from out of your family. And that when he went to Canaan, God said, come from out of your family. And while he was in Egypt, the same mandate stood, come from out of your family. And although he's tied to this boy, and his boy is his son, and he feels his nephew, and he feels responsible for this nephew, he realizes that I'm still not completely obedient. I've got to remove this thing that's causing strife because I'm trying to get all that God has called for me. Halfway won't do. I've been halfway in, halfway out this whole time, and going down to Egypt didn't work. Coming down to Haran didn't work. But when I got here in the proximity, God began to speak. And the last piece is having this boy here around me. And he seems to be the source of all the strife that's going on. And since there's strife going on from here and God has already said he's got to go, he's got to go. And so he goes to Lot. He goes to Lot. And verse 7, it says, And there was strife between the herdsmen and Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. And so Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and you, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. We are family. Is not the whole land before you separate from me? Please, please separate from me. If you take the left, I'll go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. 
Then Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you. Now, the Bible, it tells us in verse 6, it says their possessions, their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And so Abram tells Lot, he says, hey, we got to separate. I ain't, we don't have no love lost. We got to separate. We got to get apart from one another. And he says, if you go left, I go right, you just whatever. And, and a couple of things happen. I want you to see the first thing, that Abram has been dealing with God long enough that he realized that if he decides, it will not go the way that God wants. If he does it the way that he thought that he should do it, it will not go the way that God wants. And so he has decided that he would put, put it in the hands of God because God can shift Lot whatever way he will. Now, I want you to understand, Lot here is not weak. Lot isn't weak. It is not that, I mean, Abram is not weak. It's not that he's afraid that Lot is just going to overpower him. It is that he doesn't want strife in his life. But I also want you to see this, that, that, that these, 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 these followers of God, Lot by association and Abram, here are, are, are in the land around these Canaanites. They are not polytheistic. These, guys, these two guys are believing in the one true God, and because they believe in the one true God, they are supposed to be salt and light among the people, right? And the two believers, if you will, because it's, you know they're not really, they're not Jews yet, and they're not Christians. Christ hadn't come, but these two believers here are in the middle of of, of all these these polytheistic folk who are worshiping gods that are not real, and and as they are worshiping these gods that are not real, um, all they see are these two believers fighting. It's a bad look. It's a bad look. These two guys are standing there, and it seems like every time their whole group is always fighting, always upset, always having chaos. And dare I submit you, I want you to see this, that sometimes, most of the time, the reason we can't get folk to come to Christ is because the Christians are always fighting the Christians. The saved folks are always fighting the saved folks. We always got a problem with this one. I don't like them, and I'm going to fight them. And the officers are fighting the pastor, and the pastor is fighting the usher board, and the choir is fighting the, 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 the media folks. And, and there's strife among the people of God. And so it makes people who don't believe in God ask the question, why? Why would I go over there? They, they're no better than us. They're no wiser than us. They, they are not, they are not, they're no, no better than we are. And in that idea, in that thought process, we lose our witness. And so this idea, he says, I haven't lost love for you, but we need to separate because every time we're close to each other, something bad happens. Every time we're around each other, we seem to lose something. Every time we're, we're around each other, we are, we are not good for each other. And because they're not good for each other, they separated. But I also want you to see this, that Abram had possessions. So did Lot. But I want you to look at Lot's mechanism for choosing his. Lot looks around. He does what most of us do. He looks at the land, and instead of deferring and saying, well, Abram, you brought us here. You get the nice half. He looks. He said, huh, that land over there is pretty. It's well watered. It is luscious. I can make my yard look good over there. I can put me a nice little house on. It's beautiful. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna choose for myself the better option, because a lot, many com- commentaries and myself included, believe that Lot was more focused on his possessions than he was on God. You know, and it, it kind of goes like this: that Abram had possessions, but Lot, Lot's possessions had him. That Lot served his possessions, and the more possessions, the more power, the more influence that he could get, that that, that was going to draw him. And Abram had now arrived at this place that if I can just be in the will of God, if I can just be, you know, I got stuff, I got money, I got land, I got servants, I got all the things, I, I have access, the land is all mine, God is the one who gave it all to me. 
and I was letting Lot live here, I could have sent him back home. But instead, I told him to separate from me, and I gave him half the land that God gave me. What, what am I saying here? Where, where, what am I pushing? The idea that I'm pushing here is that Lot's possessions ruled him. The idea of status and stature ruled him. And while status is cool and big houses are pretty, and while we like nice things, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I like nice things and I love land, it is one of the things that I'm always looking at. Some people are always looking at cars. Some people are always looking to go buy shoes. And I like clothes, but I like land. I, I, it, is, it is who I am. And so when I look at land, I look at these things that Lot is looking at, but Lot's possessions had him. The pos having, possessing, and having, and owning owned him. Whereas Abram owned the possessions, it was cool to have the resource, but he realized he was a steward of it. And since he was a steward of it, he, he, it didn't own him, it didn't keep him, it didn't control him. And so he, his decision making was, I'm going to just trust God is going to let me get what's the best. And I want us to sit here. Because I think if more of us had the, took the posture that if I just trust God, it's going to make sure that I get what I'm supposed to have. If I'm where he told me to be and we didn't scramble and fight for position and, and power and influence, we'd have more power and position and influence because we didn't have to fight for it because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That there is no place, no platform, no position that I can, I can lose if God gave it to me. That the people might hate me, that, they, that people might try to scandalize my name. But if God put me there, I'll have everything that I need. What I also want you to see here is that about Abram, is Abram says to Lot, you know, you choose the left or the right. Abram had finally kind of learned the lesson. You know, he went halfway down to Haran, finally made it to Canaan, left Canaan and went to Egypt and lied his way through Egypt. And when he lied his way through Egypt, he realized that as he lied his way through Egypt, that as God put him out and sent him back to Canaan, that if I would have just stayed in the proximity of where God told me to be, I'd be provided for. I'd be provided for. I'd have everything that I needed if I would just be in the proximity of where God told me to be. If I would just get comfortable being where God said be. And I think we struggle with that because we can't see it. Like I said, Lot was focused on what he could see. If he, if he, he liked it, the land was luscious. He saw it was beautiful. It was more luscious and luxurious than, the, than, the, than where he allotted for Abram to go. And I think if we would focus less on what we see. I remember being a child walking the halls of Nineveh and we, it seemed as a theme in my childhood that a lot of people would say, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Especially in vacation Bible school and youth, and youth stuff and in Sunday school and Bible study on Wednesday night. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. But every time a problem would arise, it would always be, well, that don't look good. That's not logical. That doesn't make sense. And, but we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. I, and, 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 and it's like we would say it, but we wouldn't believe it. And so I think Lot had heard about God. Abram has convinced him that God is the God we're going to serve. But this idea that I'm not going to trust what I see had not registered. And I think it happens to me. It happens to you. It happens to the church. It happens to the city. That when we see something that does not look good and it does not line up with, with this, what our, our logic, we forsake faith. But that's not what Abram does here. That's not what Abram does here. Let's keep going. And Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord and like the, the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. And Lot chose for him the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they, they separated from each other, and they dwelt in the land of Canaan. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly weak, wicked. 
And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot separated from him, I want you to see this. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot separated from him. Let me just pause there. I'm going to go back and read the rest of it. But, and the Lord said to Abram, after Lot separated from him. Do y'all remember? And when Lot, and when Abram came back to where he began, then the Lord spoke. Called on the name of the Lord. Then, then God began to speak. And then God speaks. He, and the Lord says to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes now. Look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give you and your descendants forever. After Lot had separated from him, God wanted to talk to Abram alone after Lot left. This was the promise that God had made to Abram and not Abram's nephew. And I, I want to push you. Because sometimes you want to hear what everybody else has in an opinion. You want to hear what everybody else has to say about your situation. But God may not speak to you until you get quiet and hear what he has said. Because your promise isn't my promise. Your promise isn't mama's promise. Your promise isn't your nephew's promise. Your promise isn't their promise. The promise of God on your life is yours. It's yours. And so after he leaves, after Lot separates from him, he says, I'm going to give you all this land to your descendants forever and ever. And God also then wants to remind Abram that even though Abram had been generous enough to grant some of the land to his nephew, God still said that the law, the land belonged to Abram. So you were generous enough to give your, your nephew some, but it's yours. The promise is not to Lot. It's not to Lot's descendants. It is to Abraham's descendants. Abram, I'm going to give you the land. The land is for you. It is for you and your offspring. And you can let him go there. You can send him off to the side. And if that makes you feel comfortable to keep him out of your decision-making process, process toward me, that's fine. But I, that is not what I've called you to do. And then he goes on. God begins to continue to speak. He says, and then... I'm going to make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. And then arise. I want you to say, I, he, says, he says, then your descendants could also be numbered. Now, this is a promise to a man who doesn't have any kids, a man who is elderly, a man who is not a baby. God makes this promise to him, and he's like, will you try me? Will you trust me? I know you've lived most of your life, and I know you're looking at death, and you're thinking about wills and, and, and how this is going to happen. Your wife has never bore a baby, and y'all, we're not short of trying. But I, I want you to see that, that, that I'm, 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 I'm trustworthy. I'm trustworthy, and since I'm trustworthy, I'm going to give you man who should not have a baby a baby. I'm going to give you man who should not have a baby a baby. Then he says, arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, and which are in Hebron, and built an altar of the Lord. He builds another altar. He builds another altar. You know, as a, tom, a token of Abram's receipt of the land by faith, Abram wants to explore the land of promise. So he begins to explore the land. He walks through it as if it were his because it was his. You know, it, it, what, it, it, they had not re-entered it, but he walks around it. He begins to explore it. He begins to, 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 to explore it because he realizes it is a gift from God for him. And so he begins to explore the land of promise. He, explore, he walks through it as if it were his, though he did not have a record of ownership yet. There was no deed, but he had the deed of promise. He, there, was, there was no signing on the dotted line. It was not his land. No war had taken place, but he walks it. He, he, he makes sure that his feet touch it. He stands on it. He, he realizes that there is a promise embedded. Mm. There's a promise embedded on the, at the land. God has spoken. And so then he walks it. He wants to see where his descendants will walk, where they will live, where they will build their cities. He wants to see this land that they will be fighting over for generations and generations, still fighting over. He wants to see the land that by which God has promised his people. 
And so he walks it. And in the, in the same land, in the same way God wants us to explore the promises, the land of promise for us, his word, his, his promises, his physical promises, his word, his, our gifts, he wants us to walk in them as if we have been on them. He wants us to walk in them because he has promised them and because we have judged him faithful. He wants us to walk in them. He wants you to, to not just hear the, hear the word, but it will live the word. Ah, well, that's why we do living in the word. He wants you to walk in the word. He wants you to live in the word. He wants you to get comfortable in the word because God wants you to explore his promises so much so that they become so engrafted in who you are that when things happen, that the, your, what you see does not become your response, but rather what you know becomes your response. But he dwelt there by the tree, the, the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron. Mamre means vision. Hebron means communion. Mamre means vision. Hebron means communion. So he was back in the place. He was back. He had back in the place of vision, the place where God told him his descendants would live. He's back in the vision. He is. But as he's back in the vision, he is now having communion with God. He's back in communion. He's back in connection with God. And I want you to see this. You cannot have adequate vision that will later come with provision without communion with God. You can see things. You can hope for things. You can hope, hope for things. But you cannot have accurate vision without communion with God. People have ideas all the time, but ideas without communion with God are usually foolish plans. When the Bible says a man makes his plans, you, your plans that you make if you are not in communion with God will never prosper. It just won't work. And then I want you to see this, and it's the last thing that happens in the chapter. And he built an altar there to the Lord. Abram built another altar to God. He built a whole nother altar to God. He lived a life in constant awareness that he needed atonement and connection with God. And, and I want to suggest here that we don't need to deify Abram or Abraham. We don't need to make him some father Abraham, and we don't need to make statues to Abram, and we don't have to make him out to be, we don't have to do that. Because I believe that the reason God counts him so righteous, the, God, the reason that God holds him in such high esteem, is because he, A, he believed God, and he was aware that he needed constant atonement and constant connection. God, and, and, and I think the thing that we must remember is that we have atonement, we just have to accept it. The blood has already atoned. The blood was shed for enough of sin that I could never, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't sin enough not to get forgiveness. That's the first thing. But it's incumbent upon me to be in communion with him. The Bible says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice. And, and, and I, you all remember in the Revelation study, I broke that verse down. That verse was at the, at the end of the, the church, seven letters of the seven churches, the seventh church led to see the lukewarm church, the church that God says, I'll spit out my mouth. He's like, I'm on the outside of the door. I'm knocking. But if anyone would hear my voice, I'll come in and sup. In other words, that we've, it's incumbent upon us that if he's knocking on the door, we have to make a conscious decision to, A, want to hear his voice. You know, it's another thing to hear his voice. We've got to want to hear his voice. We've got to turn down some of the noise. We've got to turn down some of that excess stuff, some of the excess scrolling, some of the excess, all that stuff. We've got to turn down the noise to, A, to be able to hear his voice. And if any man hear my voice, it's still incumbent upon us to go open the door, turn the knob, and open it. Next week, we're going to dive in. Abram is going to have to go rescue Lot. <laughs> and it won't be the last time. <laughs> it won't be the last time. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to dive into chapter 14. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hang out there. Until then, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray Godspeed on you. God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your favor. But most importantly, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that somebody receives something today. And I, I hope that it doesn't fall on deaf ears or... And, and that I was sat down, that my flesh wasn't loud, but rather your spirit was, was speaking boldly and precisely. God, I pray that the word permeates. 
I pray that the word permeates deep down on the inside of somebody's heart and mind, God. That your glory, your grace, your mercy, God, it would move in the direction you'd have us to go. That we would be called the called of God and we would walk according to your will and your might. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.